I'm supposed to talk about craft, and I don't know how to do it as an English major. I didn't look up the word in advance because I've sort of been redefining myself and words ever since I quit having to study words. Basically, I couldn't decide whether I want to be an architect or a writer, and of course, I didn't decide to do either one. I found a way to uh, back into this craft, if you will, and, um, and I've been doing it for a while now, but I certainly never intended to. Because basically, when I was a kid, what craft meant, what I understood craft to be, were those things we made at Camp Craft. Camp Craft was right out there in Westlake on Camp Craft Road. Now it's McMansion Road. And you would make an ashtray. You know, well, actually, the ashtray was already made. You would just paint it, and then you would put your name on the back and give it to Mom. Or you'd make those potholders out of, you know, those rubber bands they had. And so my idea of the craft was something where you took something that was already manufactured and you just made it yours and called it yours. That exploded when I was about eight. We were at the ranch. My grandfather had a ranch 45 miles outside of Austin. We spent a lot of time there. The ranch was basically mired in the 20s and 30s, which, of course, is the time that neon signs come from. And we'll get to that in a minute. We had everything that had ever come to the ranch never left. So every truck we'd ever had was lined up by the barn, slowly being picked apart to keep the ones we had running, running. Every piece of metal that had ever been on the ranch was scattered under an oak tree next to the welding shed. I never paid much attention to that. It was just the stuff that was lying around until one day I was up there and the foreman was in the process of sketching with his cowboy boot in the dirt under that tree the outlines for a horse trailer. And in the course of that weekend, by walking around, picking up stuff, laying it on the ground, of course he let me watch and then he let me help, he built a horse trailer out of nothing out of raw materials. That, to me, is craft, where you take raw materials and by the strength of your brain and the strength and skill of your hands, you make something out of it that's useful. It doesn't have to be art. It's not art. It's got to be a useful object. There's art in it, but there's a separation between making art and making, in my case, signs. That's why I say I'm an artist and a sign maker, but I'm not a neon artist. I bristle with that term. We'll come back to that, too. We're going to come back to everything over the two days you're going to be here listening to me. Um, <laughs> Right? right? Right. Good. Good response. So I watched him build this horse train. I also watched, without knowing that was what I was watching, the power of steel. The tensile qualities of steel are amazing. I'd never thought about it before, but here was this object, and we used that horse trailer for years. I didn't know this guy could weld. I didn't know he could draw things in the dirt with a cowboy boot. So Carrying that with me forward, I didn't know that was my future either. I thought I was going to be an architect or a writer. But I had gotten interested in neon signs, and I would study neon signs mostly when we were driving west from Austin to go visit family in West Texas or New Mexico. And starting at, like, the Terminix Bug and the Tavern sign at 12th and Lamar, everything after that, the further you went out of town, the wilder it got, especially on what my mother called the Bonnet Road. All old timers called it that, because it was the road to burn it. And she would, under her breath, but in a way that I was, you know, supposed to hear, she said, that's the neon jungle. And she said it with that kind of southern disdain for everything that's seedy and sexy and, you know, lurid. And I thought, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm eight, but no kid can resist a neon sign, and the kids that are in this room can't resist it. I mean, how can you? It's screaming for your attention. It's a cartoon. It's a video. It's a cookie cutter. It's the ashtray you made for your dad. It's a potholder you made for your mom. It's all there. Somebody made that thing to get your attention for the five seconds you're driving by it. How could you ignore it? My mother, of course, was looking the other way. So, of course, that's why I named my business The Neon Jungle. It was just to piss my mother off. And she's still pissed off. Anyway, that's all later. But let's say I was interested in the signs. That still didn't mean I was going to go apprentice myself to a sign company. I was going to be a writer or an architect. I got out of college, and I didn't. An architect wasn't working out, and a writer wasn't working out, and law school didn't work out. I started making paintings that looked like signs. I didn't know how to work with metal. I didn't remember the lesson of the steel and the dirt. So I was making canvases that would, you know, be curved. I looked at Frank Stella's work, and I thought, I can do that. And I was good with tools, good with my hands, good with my brain. And so I made things, and they were incredibly difficult because I didn't go to art school. I was self-taught. 
That's going to be the rule for the rest of the lecture. I'm all self-taught. I never apprenticed. By the time I finished the one painting that took two years, I realized I can't do this. I got to get a job. And I became an antique dealer. And in the course of being an antique dealer, I drove all over the Southwest. I ranged from Austin to San Francisco. That was my hunting ground. I went down every back road, 60,000 miles a year, mostly buying cowboy boots in those days. And I was kind of got a little famous for that. But I was also seeing signs and taking pictures. And then one day, I found one on the ground. And it was 20 bucks. It was for sale. I thought, oh, I can buy this. I don't, you know, this is great. And that became the beginning of a terrible addiction. I started buying signs all the time, and I quickly had a pile of them, and I then started trying to restore them. This is 88, 89, into the 90s. And I started selling them to people, and I'd have to get them restored, so I had to get familiar with neon guys, but still I wasn't making them. I was just an appreciator and a dealer. The day I, I tumbled into actually making them and using my skills for good, um, was when a, a, somebody came to my shop and said, well, these are all fine, these vintage signs. And by the way, the, uh, the no vacancy sign here and the Kodak sign are both vintage. The one behind me is one I built from scratch. So I had these kind of things hanging up. And they said, well, this is all well and good, but can't you find me a sign that's like shaped like the state of Texas? No more than six feet wide. I like red, and it'd be good if it had my initials on it. And I said, that doesn't <laughs> fucking exist. And if it does, it's not for sale. And he's like, well, that's what I want. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to figure this out. So I called and made an appointment with one of the biggest sign companies in town at the time. This is probably 1991. And I went in, and the, the guy who's still in business here met me in his office, very gracious, and said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I want you to make me some old signs. He goes, ah, oh, son, nobody wants them old signs anymore. I said, well, actually, I've got some people who do, and they'll pay for them. Yeah, well, nobody knows how to make those anymore. I said, really? You don't know how to make them? Well, sure, I used to make them with my dad back in the day, but no, nah, nobody wants those anymore. What the sign business is about, son, is raceway signs, channel letters, kind of like the one above the bar, where it's a, you know, it's a programmatic sign. You got a long shoebox with letters on the front of it. That's a really nice one. But most of them aren't very nice. You see them in every strip mall in America between 1965 and now. And I said, well, that's not what my people want. They want, and I showed him pictures. You know, state of Texas, six feet wide, the initials red. And he said, nah, you know, there's no money in that. We stick to doing the same thing over and over again. That's where the money is. And I thought, well, that's great, but that's not what I want. Just give me a price. And really, probably just to get me out of his office, he basically said, okay, $5,000. That was about $2,500 more than I thought it was going to be. And I thanked him. I said, great, I'll get back to you. And of course, I never got back to him again. I walked out of there and I thought, I bet I can do this. I mean, I've taken apart enough of them. I've studied them. They're not that hard when you look. And I, and I invite you to come up here and see these. They're not as heavy as you think they are. They're not as complicated. What they are is a testament to the tensile qualities of steel and to the evocative qualities of glass and the paint that brings the two together. I was already figuring all that out before I met this guy. So basically, driven by rage and revenge, I became a sign maker. And I, I thought, I can do this. I mean, what have I got to lose? I can make five grand or 3,500. And so I made my first sign. And at that time, I was a antique dealer still, and I had that shop, but I also had a booth in the original Uncommon Objects, and uh, I was dealer number one, and I hung that sign in there, and I sold it. And I thought, hmm. And then it's just a slippery slope, you know, from there down to the very bottom of the hill and beyond, and it became a full-time obsession. I started making signs for people, mostly for antique dealers, because that's who I knew, and of course, in those days, South Congress was all antique dealers and hookers um, and drunks, <laughs> drunk antique dealers, drunk hookers. And so I had a client base built in because they all knew me and I was coming from their left field. I wasn't selling them a channel letter sign. I wasn't selling them a raceway sign. I wasn't selling them what they didn't want. What they wanted was something 
evocative of who they were and that would represent them. And so this is where the craft comes in. Craft splits into two things in my mind. What I do is advertising. It's not art, it's advertising. What we're trying to do is communicate with the public quickly, effectively, five seconds. I used to tie to a video once about the five second rule that basically everything in my business, and I learned all this by deduction. I never studied with anybody. I just had to figure it out by studying the signs. But the five second rule I learned from animation routines. Animations when you do a series of neon things to make it look like movement in the same way that you would do little doodles in your books when you were bored in class and then flip it to make it look like, you know, the Roadrunner cartoons. County line pigs, things like that. The lariat going around on uncommon objects. Those are all signs I did. So the whole idea was that you, whatever you were gonna do, whatever statement you were gonna make, whether it was animated or not, had to be done in five seconds because that's all the attention span you could get out of your average human, moving either at sidewalk speed or 55 miles an hour, or worse, 70 miles an hour. So you had to think about that. And how you built the sign had to be pitched to that, where you put it. So the first thing I would do in any time after talking to the client about what they wanted and figuring out how am I gonna build this, I had to think, okay, what's the angle of the sun? Which way is the traffic coming from? Which sounds like a gunfighter thing, but it really was about how they're going to see it, because they're not gonna see it for long. And I've got to form an impression with that thing that you know, makes it rock, makes it come back to haunt them so that they'll come back and spend money so that I'll look good. Because I don't advertise, ironically, the signs are somebody else's advertisement, but it advertises for me. If I do a good job, I'll get more work. Five seconds is now down to two. We've done studies. And the reason it's down to two is because everybody's looking at the front. And they're not paying attention to where the mic is or to anything else but their phone. So you've got less than half the time we used to, so you better fucking make it good. Which is why I don't design signs anymore. I don't have to. There's a million designers here in the room who are going to do it for me, and I love my designers because they're the ones who are going to get the ideas out of the client's head and get them on paper and get into something that's branded and it's going to be universal, and all I have to do is engineer it, and that's plenty. That's plenty for me to do is to engineer it, imagineer it into some sort of confection that is going to explode in the mind of the viewer. So then that sets up the craft of how you actually build it. And the building of it comes down to two things. You know, what is the most glorious thing we can do for your money? <laughs> How much can you spend? Because, I mean, I'll, I'll go all out. And I, the other beauty of not being a designer is that I only get one idea. I sometimes design signs, and people say, well, show me the looks. It's like, there are no looks. There's one look, and I came up with it in the first five seconds, and that's all I got. So I hope you like it. And, and they usually do, but it's much better for the designer to have worked that out, and I just imagine near the thing. You put all that together, and I've got to actually build it. And the way we build it, the actual craft of this, when I actually get to finally build it, which is what I'm best at, I think, is basically coming up with a full-scale rendering of it, which we do on paper, usually using an overhead projector. I mean, this is all done in the way it was done 100 years ago. Doing it that way gives me pleasure, partly because I don't know how to use a computer, and partly because I feel like I'm still channeling the old guys who taught me. Of course, these old guys, I've never met them. I'm taught by their work. But the first thing I learned from their work was this. I was buying signs that were 60, 70 years old, and they still worked. They were still up on the building. The electricity still worked. The transformers were still good. The glass was still good. I figured if I just made it like they did, my work could be around 60, 70 years if the business survived. That was a pretty easy lesson. I mean, I don't know why I didn't think of that before. All I had to do was kind of copy them. And I never copy anybody's outright work, but copy the spirit behind it and the methods behind it. And really, that's all I've been doing for the last 25 years is just channeling the old guys. It helped that I knew a couple of old guys. I had an early mentor, a neon tube bender who had used to own a complete sign company up in Abilene, Texas, and he was still bending glass for me last year when he died at age 91. That's craft, that's longevity, and that's love. 
And he was good about telling me little things, but he never, you know, coached me. I just had to figure it out for myself. So basically, we make a paper pattern, we transfer that to sheet metal, whether it's aluminum or just, you know, flat galvanized metal, and we cut it out. I usually cut it out with shears or a jigsaw. I'll admit, sometimes we use a water jet now that's computer guided, but I don't guide it. I don't know how to do that. And then having done that, we start putting it together with rivets. And if you want to know my signature, because I don't sign my work, but if you're walking down the street and you see a sign where you can see all the rivets, probably mine, because nobody does that anymore. All the old signs back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s were done with hammer rivets. We've kind of lost that technology. But we have pop rivets, and so I use that. It's the, it's the closest thing. And I wasn't just trying to slavishly copy them. It was just that it works, so I, I'd why screw with it. And so I've done it that way ever since. And now I've kind of made a fetish of it because it's, I like how it looks, and I think other people like how it looks. And I think what they like about how it looks is it looks like it was made by hand. And I've told this joke a lot. You know, my signs look like they were made by hand because they were made by hand, these hands. I do my own work, by and large. Now, I found somebody to do painting for me. And of course, I get somebody else to do the neon. So let's talk about that for a second. The three things that go into any successful neon sign and there are three separate crafts. There's the metalwork, there's the paint on the metalwork, and then there's the neon on top of that. And I think of it as kind of like a layer cake. You know, the, you've got a sculpture hiding behind a painting underneath a line drawing. And they should work together. Sometimes they don't, but they should. And that's what we strive for every time. So that it looks good during the day, it looks good at night, it looks good broken because sooner or later it may be broken. And in fact, I kind of like it when they start to break down. I mean, that's, and that goes to the unintentional poetry. You know, when you see a shell station, and of course no shell stations have neon anymore, but the S would be out and it goes, hell. It's like, better, better title. Um, and that was the kind of thing I would photograph back in the days when I was just roaming around taking pictures. I haven't made that sign yet because I don't want to get sued, but um, I might anyway, just for saying it. In any case, I've done everything but the neon tube bending. The people who bend neon, that's all they do. I tell people it's like being a short order cook on a line. You're basically tied to the stove all day. If you leave the stove for a second, you're losing money. And they literally, it's almost like having a ticket. They make that one and then they make the next one and then they make the next one and they make the next one. And that's how they make money. It takes patience, it takes discipline. And as you may have figured out, I have neither. I might have discipline, but not for that. And so you go to the people who do that, they're called tube benders, and they do it. So I'll make the pattern and take it to them, which really means I'm a signed contractor. I hire myself to build the can, I do all my own welding, going back to that you know, ranch experience, the power of steel. But the painting, I found there's people better than me, and I'm all about hiring people better than me. It isn't hard to find somebody better than me at painting. And so, you know, I'll build the can, I'll take it to the painter, he'll paint it to my specifications, and I'll take the tube pattern to the tube bender, they'll make it to my specifications, and then I put the whole thing together, usually off a ladder after we've already put the sculpture of the can up on the building. We put the glass on last because if we don't, we'll break it. That's the thing. Neon is, you know, trapped inside a glass tube and it will last for a very long time. Like I said, I was t taking tubes off of signs that were 60, 70 years old and they still worked. I thought that was amazing. It's not as fragile as you think. And yet, you know, there's two things that can destroy it. One of them is humans and one of them is weather. Well, once you get it in the air, you can pretty much stop worrying about humans. I mean, people are always asking me, oh, so what's the thing that breaks signs the most? Is it like drunks throwing beer bottles and stuff like that? And I'll say, no, drunks can't throw. <laughs> they release late, you know, and then they, get, then they get embarrassed and angry and maudlin and start crying. Um, we studied this when I lived at the Horseshoe Lounge. Um, but weather, weather is different. Torrential rain is our biggest enemy. And so the metal box it's not just there to be a cookie cutter and to look cool, though we certainly try to make it do all that, but what it really is is an enclosure for the transformers. In other words, it, this is form-following function. It's form-following fantasy, 
for you, but for me, it's function. I've got to think about where those transformers go, how the whole thing works, and, and I learned this the hard way, like I learned everything, how to make it to where it can be serviced later. Because you never want to be up a ladder with your hand inside a sign up to your armpit going, what stupid son of a bitch designed this so that they couldn't get to the, oh, wait a minute. It was me. Still the stupid son of a bitch. So you don't want to be in that position. Of course, that's how I learned about that was by being in that position. In all of this, you're, I'm learning from my mistakes and I'm learning also from the situation of thanks to that guy at that sign company, I never wanted to build a bad sign. There are plenty of bad signs out there and people say, don't you hate the bad signs? I go, no, I love the bad signs. They make me look good. I need all the help I can get. So I haven't had to, really. I mean, I've built some stuff that I wasn't as proud of as other stuff, but by and large, I get, especially at this point in my career, I get to build what I want for who I want. And that's the other secret ingredient of this, folks. If you don't have a client base, you're starving. This is advertising, it's not art. People are buying this because I'm advertising their businesses. And fortunately for me, the people I've worked with over the years, including, by the way, Rambler, and Cuvee Coffee, both clients of mine, are badasses. They've come up with concepts and dreams and they've put their hearts and souls into it and they've driven past all the trouble and they're surviving, or at least they're trying to. And I tap into that. These people become my friends. These are the people who are at my wedding. These are the people I drink with, eat with, hang out with. We're all in this together. We're trying to get the American dream done, which is trying to make commerce out of your wildest fantasy. And so I find that infectious. What I don't want to do is make things for, you know, national chains. I like making one of a kind. And we run into some problems with that. You know, we're having to deal with the fact that, for instance, Chewy's, who I made, you know, the original Barton Springs signs back in the 90s, Chewy's got bought 10 years ago. They open a new Chewy's every two weeks somewhere in America. A lot of people don't know that. And so I put a sign in every Chewy's they open. And the struggle is, how do we make, you know, 100 different ideas? It's not that I don't have 100 different ideas. It's just hard to keep the price point down and keep doing it. And yet, that's what we do, is try to make it seem original and fresh every time, sometimes when we're tired, sometimes when we're, you know, on the verge of repeating ourselves. And that's the beauty of craft. If you're doing it by yourself and you're doing it with your hands, you're never going to do it the same way twice. There is no assembly line. Something's going to go wrong. Something's going to go horribly wrong. More likely, something's going to go deliciously wrong. Wrong is how I learn. Wrong is the only way I learned. I never studied this, never meant to. Thank you, everybody. And the thing is, I, I joke that I make jewelry for buildings. It's not just the service of the clients, I'm in the service of that street, that theater. And I love the way that theater looks. And of course the theater's always changing, more, now more than ever. And part of me wants to quit, you know, because it isn't gonna all be old buildings on South Congress anymore. And, you know, I often think that old buildings are the best setting for my old signs. But that's not a choice I have. And the fact is, I want to stay in it, and I'm not leaving Austin. I'm not running away. I'm not going to complain, oh, yeah, I was better back when I was doing it in the 90s, and we could do whatever we wanted. I can still do whatever I want, and I'm going to do whatever I want on whatever kind of building there is, but only if y'all want it. Again, I'm in advertising. I build to the audience. I build what works, and if it doesn't work, it'll get replaced, and that's life. <laughs>